Sup, Jooms. Hope you all had a preem Thanksgiving and enjoyed your tofurkeys like I did. So, in the last few videos, I have gotten back on track to talking about what I enjoy the most on this channel, which is giving you hair loss witchers preem deets on the latest cutting-edge hair loss treatments currently in the pipeline, like hair cloning and vertiporfin. There is another treatment, though, that is in development that I have spoken about a few times, but not as enthusiastically as I have spoken about other treatments. I'm talking specifically about HMI 115 here, Jooms. So, out of all the upcoming hair loss treatments in development, HMI 115 has generated a particular interest amongst the finasteride hating and DHT simping communities, and that is because its mechanism of action is different from other hair loss treatments, which usually target DHT through one mechanism or another. HMI 115, on the other hand, targets prolactin, and because of this, DHT cells are absolutely thrilled because they think HMI 115 has finally validated all of their DHT simping throughout the years. They're now all saying things like, like, oh yeah, if blocking DHT were so important for fighting hair loss, then why does HMI-115 work when it blocks prolactin instead? It is clear the androgen hypothesis is deeply flawed and wrong, and stopping hair loss is far more complex than just stopping DHT, so haha. -ha. Well, like I said, I have already done a few videos on HMI-115 where I have expressed skepticism about it, but before we delve into the subject again, let me give some background information on HMI-115 by explaining what it is exactly and what has caused it to be so hyped up by finasteride haters and DHT simps within the hair loss community. So, in the last video, it turns out that some guy named MoMan who posts on the Tressless subreddit just so happens to also be a subject in the Phase 1 clinical trial for HMI-115. He decided it would be a brilliant idea to broadcast his own results on the drug to the entire world before the trial was even complete. Apparently, some troll decided it would be funny to snitch on him, but it turns out he did have permission to show his results online, which is a little strange to me. I think even with him having permission to do this, though, it was still a very bad idea to broadcast his results to the world because it can give people a false impression about the drug. After all, the results in just one subject aren't going to necessarily reflect the overall benefit of the drug. He could have been an outlier one way or the other. I don't know the full story behind the whole MoMan leak controversy and how it affected the clinical trial because he ended up deleting the thread. All I know is that it caused a lot of drama, so for future reference, if you are a subject in an ongoing clinical trial, trial, please don't fucking disclose your results before the results of the whole trial are published. Even if you are given permission, it is still not a good idea. Anyways, in the midst of that whole controversy, everyone sort of lost track of the most important element of everything, and that is whether or not HMI-115 actually works at all. So, before we get to the latest on HMI-115, let's just review what it is and how it is supposed to work. We know it inhibits prolactin, but there are already other drugs in the market that lower prolactin levels like cabergoline, and those drugs don't stop hair loss at all, so there is more to HMI-115's mechanism of action than just lowering prolactin levels. In fact, HMI-115 doesn't actually lower prolactin levels at all, which I'll explain in a moment. So. Before HMI-115 was even called HMI-115, it was called BAY-1158061. It was developed in a partnership between Bayer, who make aspirin, and a Chinese company named Hope Medicine. Here is the original patent for the drug. It was filed in January of 2019. I think Hope Medicine must have taken over development of the drug at some point, which is why the name was changed to HMI-115. In fact, if you remember my original video on HMI-115, I called it Bayer Prolactin Antibody because it was still being developed by the Bayer Corporation. So, what is HMI-115? Well, it is a monoclonal antibody to the receptor for the hormone prolactin. So like I said before, it doesn't actually lower prolactin levels, but instead it negates the effects of prolactin by interfering with the receptor that prolactin binds with. Some early animal research showed that prolactin delays the hair cycle in mice and that prolactin deficient mice have more rapid hair growth than normal mice. Here's a figure from that paper. In all four mice, hair was grafted from a dark-haired mouse to a white-haired mouse. In panels A and C, the hair was grafted from a mouse lacking prolactin Lactin, and in panels B and D, the hair came from a normal mouse. You can see that the hair grew better when it came from a prolactin deficient mouse. However, it turns out the prolactin story is a lot more complicated than just that, Jones. In this study from 2006, it was found that prolactin doesn't just affect hair follicles, it is actually produced by the hair follicles. That's right, it's not just an endocrine hormone produced by the pituitary gland, it is actually a paracrine or autocrine hormone, meaning it acts locally where it is produced, much like DHT. 
The study found that in cultured human hair follicles, prolactin would inhibit hair growth and shorten the hair cycle by inducing apoptosis, meaning programmed cell death. That means that prolactin signals the end of the antigen growth phase and the start of the catagen transition phase, which is when the hair follicle transitions from the antigen growth phase into the telogen resting phase. However, the role of prolactin is more complicated than that. For example, high prolactin levels are often associated with hirsutism. That means unwanted hair growth in women. These women usually have increased testosterone levels as well as increased 5-air activity, which results in higher levels of DHT. So high DHT in women not only causes hair loss from androgenic alopecia, but it can also cause unwanted facial hair growth, which goes to show once again that DHT is a trash hormone of both men and women. Anyways, this study here from way back in 1986 found that human prolactin in vitro, meaning in a test tube, actually inhibited the 5-air enzyme in the skin, as you can see in this graph here. As you can see, with higher concentrations of prolactin, there was less conversion of testosterone into DHT by the 5-air enzyme. However, in the study, there was no statistical correlation between serum prolactin levels and skin 5-air enzyme levels, so it's still not clear what, if any, effect prolactin has on 5-air activity and DHT. From the in vitro results, you'd think that if prolactin actually decreased 5-air activity, it would promote hair growth rather than stop it, at least in people with androgenic alopecia. However, this was an effect that occurred just in vitro, and actually, there is no evidence that prolactin inhibits the 5-air enzyme in the scalp. So, it turns out that the effects of prolactin on hair growth aren't as predictable as you would hope. As you can see in this figure here, prolactin can actually promote the androgen growth phase in females, which would actually cause hair growth growth while it promotes the catagen phase that ends the angen growth phase in men. So interestingly enough, the role of prolactin in hair growth may actually be sex dependent. That's different from DHT since we know lowering DHT in both men and women promotes hair growth in people with androgenic alopecia. Also, since prolactin is both produced by the hair follicles and the hair follicle is the target of prolactin, it may be that it is the local prolactin that is important for hair growth rather than the serum prolactin, which may be why drugs like cabergoline don't stop hair loss. As this review article on prolactin and hair states, quote, these findings also raise the possibility that the hair follicle response to prolactin is sex and or location dependent, unquote. So the researchers seem to share my conclusions here. Even if HMI-115 does work, it looks like it will be a treatment for men only. So... Besides the role of prolactin in the hair cycle, prolactin is obviously important for women because as you can tell from the name prolactin, it is a hormone that causes pregnant women and Jason Blaha to lactate. So for a long time, prolactin has been the target of hate from the online manosphere of internet tough guy incels who think it is a trash hormone, which is ironic since these very same communities like to simp for DHT, which is the actual trash hormone. It is true that for a long time it was thought that prolactin didn't have much of a role in men, but we know now today that this may not be true. I went over the effects of low prolactin levels in men in my video titled The Truth About Prolactin and Hair Loss, but in hindsight, I probably should have titled it Prolactin is Not a Trash Hormone. I won't go over all the research again here, but what you need to know is that low prolactin levels are associated with sexual dysfunction, low libido, infertility, and neurological problems. Essentially, all the problems people who claim to have post-finasteride syndrome say they have. Yet these same people who are afraid to take finasteride are totally hyped up about HMI-115, which could paradoxically end up causing all the same problems they are afraid finasteride will cause them. The research is fairly new, so we don't understand all the effects of low prolactin levels in men yet. It's also possible that some of these effects are not directly related to low prolactin levels. As this review states, quote, Whether prolactin plays a direct role in these physiologic functions, with low prolactin causing their impairment, or it is an epiphenomenon of different mechanisms, is still a matter of speculation and deserves further studies, unquote. So, I already showed you the patent for HMI-115 that was filed in 2019. This was based on work done in 2015 when researchers from Bayer Laboratories published a study showing that they had developed an antibody to the prolactin receptor. When this antibody was injected into mice, it would mimic what was seen in mice that genetically lacked the prolactin receptor. What made Tressless and Finasteride haters jizz their pants the most, though, was this study on macaca monkeys. These monkeys are the only other primate besides humans that can have androgenic alopecia. So, 
In the study, 9 out of 11 monkeys injected with a prolactin receptor antibody supposedly responded to the treatment. So, maybe at this point you're thinking, but Kevin, these results sound encouraging. Sure, I don't want to wipe out all my prolactin, but if you just put this antibody on the scalp, it's kind of like topical minoxidil. You get all the benefits and you won't get systemic sides, bro. Well. That sounds great, except for one tiny little problem. HMI-115 isn't a small molecule that can be absorbed through the skin directly into the hair follicles. It is an antibody. That means it is a large protein. It turns out that the drug has to be injected under the skin. Interestingly enough, it is not injected locally into the scalp. Rather, it is injected into the abdomen every two or four weeks. So sorry to say it, Chooms, this drug definitely does go systemic, so anybody thinking this treatment is going to have zero side effects is absolutely absolutely fucking kidding themselves. So where do we stand today on HMI-115? Well, I mentioned the phase 1 trial that Moman on Tressless almost got kicked off of because he was leaking his results. That study was looking at treatment with HMI-115 in just 16 subjects over a treatment period of 24 weeks. It looked at changes in hair counts for each subject. That study finished in September of this year, but unfortunately we have no official results from that study yet. But fortunately, we are not completely empty-handed here, Chooms. Thanks to an internet sleuth on Trustless who was in correspondence with Momen, we have a before and after picture of Momen, and looking at the picture, you may not be able to determine which picture is the before and which is the after. All kidding aside, I do see some improvement here, but these results are extremely mediocre. Let's compare this to a typical before and after picture from someone using Finasteride, for instance. It's like night and day, and this isn't some hyper-responder I cherry -pick. You go online and Google before and after pictures of finasteride, and results like this are very typical. Now, I did say that Momen could have been an outlier, so maybe the other subjects got better results than him, but it's clear Momen is no macaca monkey. So, maybe the results overall were more favorable, because the big news is that Hope Medical has started enrolling subjects in a phase 2 study for HMI-115 and male subjects with androgenic alopecia. The study will enroll 180 subjects, and the results should be out by the end of next year. Year. The study will have a placebo control group as well as three treatment arms, including one using 120 milligrams of HMI 115 every four weeks, one using 240 milligrams every four weeks, and one using 240 milligrams every two weeks. The study is currently ongoing in Red China. So, even if the phase one study results were favorable, it's hard to make much out of a study with only 16 subjects. That small of a study is especially poor at looking for side effects. If side effects were as high as 8% for instance, then it is possible a study with a sample size of just 16 subjects would detect no side effects at all. Doing the math, there is about a 25% chance that you would not detect such a frequent side effect. So I could be wrong, and this drug may turn out to be extremely well tolerated and extremely effective, but we will need to wait at least a year for the results of the phase 2 trial to give us any useful information, and by then we'll be pretty close to having much more effective treatments like GT20029, which I have a video for which I'll link below. Anyways. As you can tell, I am more skeptical of this treatment than a lot of other people. A prolactin receptor antibody may end up being an effective growth stimulant comparable to something like minoxidil, but it won't get to the underlying cause of androgenic alopecia, which of course is the trash hormone DHT. It might end up being a good adjunctive therapy, but the people who think that HMI-115 is their ticket out of having to use a 5-AR inhibitor are just smoking way too much copium. Also, there's another catastrophic problem with HMI-115 that nobody seems to be talking about, and that's the drug's price. HMI-115 is a monoclonal antibody. Do you guys have any idea just how expensive monoclonal antibodies are? Here's a graph from a paper that compared the yearly cost of monoclonal antibody treatments for different medical conditions. The cost is often in the range of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Sometimes health insurance will cover monoclonal antibodies to make them more affordable, such as with the COVID monoclonal antibody, but that is because health insurance will cover medically necessary treatments. But most health insurance companies will not cover treatments for what they consider cosmetic conditions like androgenic alopecia. I mean, they're not paying for most people's hair transplants, I imagine, so good luck convincing your health insurer to spend tens of thousands of dollars for you to take a monthly injection of a monoclonal antibody for the rest of your life because you're too dickless to use finance which cost about $10 per month. So, 
Even in the best case scenario, HMI-115 will be a treatment for only the super rich, and chances are even rich people will have better and cheaper alternatives by the time HMI-115 actually hits the market, which makes me question if HMI-115 is even a viable product at all. I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if this treatment never hits the market. So I am not saying these things to be a stick in the mud. I'd like to see new innovative treatments hit the market too, but I think it's important to remember that a lot of the hype about HMI-115 is coming from people who hate finasteride, and therefore they're looking at the research through rose-colored goggles because they're desperate for any alternative to finasteride they can possibly find since they're absolutely terrified of the drug. Fortunately though, we do have finasteride alternatives in the pipeline that are very promising, but most of them work by going after DHT or by going after one of the downstream effects of DHT because the fact of the matter is, is that DHT is what causes hair loss, not prolactin, and no amount of kicking, crying, screaming, and scalp massages are ever going to change that fact. If you want to stop hair loss, you've got to do something about the DHT. If you're not willing to do that, well, Ball Cafe's channel is just around the corner. All right, chooms, I'll see you again next time. God bless.